thank you for stopping by the channel. Here are a couple of Reddit cheating stories for your listening pleasure. This is long, but I've been struggling on and off for a month and anyone who can offer some feedback, my heart goes to you. My wife and I are effectively high school sweethearts from different schools together since 16 together, 20 years married for 12, one daughter trying for our second child. Like a lot of infidelity stories, we were not at our highest emotional peak. When it happened, we spent much of 2021 trying for our second child, the pressures and disappointments of it not happening were hard on both of us knowing how especially hard it had been on her. I constantly tried to be there, it's okay. Next month, we just try again, person with a brave, optimistic face, which was apparently interpreted as, I didn't care. Sex became so regimented around an ovulation schedule. It sucked a lot of fun out of it. She wanted more spice and felt like her needs weren't getting met in that way. But, on the flip side, I had historically hit a lot of brick walls and nose around creativity. So, I too felt like my own needs were underserved. There were some communication roadblocks around all of it. There were also the all too typical challenges of being new parents with limited childcare outside of when we are both at work, not a lot of us time, which leads to a rut feeling. And the feeling of just being at the job and parent, I should note that one thing that makes all of this so much harder is that I am not the jealous or possessive type. And I mean, at all, in 20 years, I felt like trust and faithfulness was a pillar of our relationship. I was also well aware of feeling like we were in a pressure rut, and I was proactively taking big steps to fix that. I was taking steps as major as completely changing my role at work. So my hours meant, I would be home almost nightly. I had to work evenings about three times a week, which was getting hard on all of us. After relying on family for most of three years, I was seeking a local sitter to make sure we could start to have a regular day night going forward. And I had some spice up ideas and gifts lined up for that holiday in February. I know there are ups and downs in long-term relationships and that the situation we were in was challenging, but always worth working through. During the fall, she befriended a new male coworker. Like I said, I'm not any jerk jealous and thought nothing of it. A lot of early communication was around sharing he and his wife's own fertility issues with child number two. As time passed, it seemed like he was mentioned more and more in work stories, even though they definitely don't work directly with one another. But again, not the jealous type. A few months ago, we had another crushing month of not getting pregnant. She was particularly emotional this time around and texted me from work saying she had a coworker, made it sound like a girlfriend, asking to take her out for a drink in response to her hard day and asking, would I be fine if she did that while I had our daughter? Of course, go have fun, get your mind off things, chat with a friend. Hell, I've been trying to convince you to do things like this every once in a while for a long time, but you constantly cite, mom guilt, please go. I am an extremely hands-on dad with caretaking, the kiddo, and I have the house held down. Turns out the friend was said co-worker. Now I can't stress this enough in 20 years. I don't think I have ever had anything that qualifies as a huge, jealous reaction before she claimed it was platonic, but I was pissed. In retrospect, her failure to mention who the co-worker was felt like an intentional omission. She and I rarely had child coverage to have a date night. But in this case, I was used as the childcare to go out for drinks one-on-one -on -one with another guy. And in response to her extremely emotional state, I explained that this was a big emotional boundary issue in my eyes. For contrast, I explained that if I had a married female coworker who was feeling emotionally fragile, I would never take her out for drinks one on one without knowing her husband personally, or more importantly, knowing it was something he was aware of and comfortable with. She made me sound like I was crazy for thinking it was anything more than just drinks with a friend, but it just didn't pass the straight face test for me. But, I quickly gathered myself, talked more rationally about how I felt. She acknowledged that she wasn't thinking about it from my point of view and we moved on, fast forward, just under two months. It's 6 a.m. and our daughter is always up early. We often alternate getting up with her so the other can get a little bit more sleep. I take her downstairs and we use my wife's work iPad to run the PBS Kids app. I am not a snoop, but as I go to get it set up, I'm taken aback by the iPad home screen being littered with notifications of private chat messages with this employee talking about coming over to our house at 7 p.m. the previous night, how they have a fun, uncomplicated arrangement that will have to be put on hold in a few weeks. The week, my schedule was changing for the reasons I said before and so forth. I was in a total state of shock when I confronted her. She got a look of dread and shame in the little time we had to communicate quietly as to not alert our daughter. I found out that he had been lying to his own family about going to work for his second job, coming over once a week on nights. 
I worked late for the last five weeks straight with the intention to go two more rounds until of course my schedule wasn't as convenient for their arrangement. She tried to plead that she never meant to hurt me or our relationship. And she was 100% committed to us. I have never been more frazzled and feeling like I was spiraling in my life. I send a lot of angry texts, as you can imagine, my coworkers knew I wasn't okay. I played it off. Like I got bad news on the family health front and had to leave. There was no way I could focus. I drove home and tried to convince myself. Things weren't as bad as it seemed. I went to reread the messages to see if I reacted too strongly and wouldn't, you know, the two had a new chat going. It was clear that he was aware I found out, but the conversation didn't seem to, oh no. In fact, it was a bizarre combination of chatty, Kathy friendly. Talk about what they made for food the night before and her inviting him down to her room at lunch to go through her phone, listing her lock screen password and read her private messages. The angry texts, I don't know about any of you, but if you cheated, crap hit the fan and the wound was extremely fresh. Your claim is that you're committed to the relationship. There's something about immediately going to the affair partner and saying, hey, come have lunch with me and go through my phone. Doesn't sit right on the, where's your loyalty front? All the hallmarks of emotional and physical betrayal were there, of course, but there were so many reasons that this was extra bad circumstantially. 1. It was done while we were trying to get pregnant with child. Number 2. After bonding with this person over stories about fertility struggles, I mean, that alone is messed up too. There is nothing she cited about where her head was at the time that couldn't also be said about me, but I was working on solutions and an extramarital affair. Isn't even on the radar 3. While we struggled to get us time with the toddler at home, I was effectively used as childcare. So she could have that sort of time out with someone else, which was also the night that talk of each of them wanting more in the bedroom, heated up for as far as wanting more goals. I already mentioned my plans for helping break out of the rut, but she had put up so many brick walls with me. It was hard to even know what direction to go and forget crazy ideas to spice things up. We're talking things. Most couples would consider pretty basic. She wouldn't please me orally because it gave her locked jaw that she could never do a certain position sexually because it hurt and that her OBGYN has acknowledged that had something to do with her pelvis, that she was long past wearing anything that wasn't comfortable underneath. That she's been extremely self-conscious about her breasts since nursing and always wanted to keep them covered since, and you know what, even if there were things I wanted, I would never push her in any way. She wasn't comfortable, but come to find out everything she ever took off the table for me was apparently on the table for him during the affair, even busted out lingerie. She wore on our wedding night that she never wore for me again. In 12 years, 5, we've been together since we were 16 frigging years old. She is the only person I've ever been with while it's natural for anyone to have passing curiosities in a lifetime. It creates this imbalance when one person acts on them and only one is left faithful for basically life, whether it was stopping the affair to begin with, or taking extremely active steps to improve communication and things with us. None of these were conclusions that happened on their own. This wasn't a, what have I done? This was a mistake and I need to come clean moment. This was over time, methodical and had planned for more, but I got caught. Attempts at improving anything with us in ways she never did before all just feel like concessions. Now, the fallout is a long separate story in itself. I spent two weeks sleeping on separate floors. Most nights we had big emotional powwows, sometimes in ways that could have been considered productive, but I have a hard time letting the most hurtful thing someone has done to me be viewed as any sort of positive turning point. I have been trying to give reconciliation a shot, but my feelings about it and what it means for our relationship are all over the map. Before I say too much about it, I could just really use some feedback to anyone who got through all of that. Thanks for listening. Hello, everyone. My marriage story is different than the rest of the stories posted here. It will be a long one as well. Please have a look at it. I am not from the US, but I have been working here in the US since I was 23. And now I am 30 and going to be 31 soon. I am from a developing country and I did both my bachelor's and master's in computer science engineering from an Ivy League school here in the US. So basically, I have been in the US since I was 16. My father is a government employee and my mother is a homemaker. I have an elder sister who is a doctor and she is married and mother of two children. Both me and my sister were brilliant academically. She wanted to be a doctor and she is now, I wanted to be an engineer and wanted to pursue my bachelor's in the US. I am currently working in a world-renowned company that we all know. We use the company products every day in all walks of our life. 
I have an arranged marriage. When I got married, I was 27 and my wife was 21. After completion of my master's and getting the job in my dream company, I moved to a new city. I stayed with two of my friends in a shared accommodation for three years. Then one of my friends got married. And so we vacated that place and took our own place to rent. I took a three-bedroom, four-bath apartment in a posh area in the city, which is 15 minutes away from my office. I met an American man in the new apartment complex and he was my neighbor. He is a car salesman for a high-end car company distributor and was sharing the apartment with two guys. He helped me a lot. I mean a lot. I considered him as a close friend. He voluntarily would come to me once a week and will ask me if I need help. I would invite him to both lunch and dinner at my place. Almost every weekend, he would come to my place to watch sports. And we will talk about various topics. Whenever I will go home, my mother will send a lot of gifts for him, and he is always very happy to receive them as well. I never asked him about his personal life neither. He also never asked me anything. Anyway, I got married and of course he was invited. And I booked tickets for him and paid for the visa. He was not able to go because of some work-related thing. My wife came with me after her visa processing. I was very happy. My wife is very beautiful. I am a tall guy, 6 feet 3 inches, and my wife is 5 feet 8 inches. She came from a well-established family and a lovely person. She has a bachelor's degree in history. Seven months back, I was at home working and I heard my wife crying. I walked up to her and asked what happened. She was in the living room, on the couch watching TV. I thought something on TV she saw, made her cry. Upon asking, she started bawling and I was clueless. And I was still thinking it's because of the TV, but I was unable to find anything emotional on the TV. She started saying how sorry she was and how she ruined everything. I was still trying to understand what was happening and told her, don't worry. We can always fix whatever was ruined. No need to cry. And she looks ugly while crying and she should always smile. The next six to eight hours were hell for me. She told me how two years back, for a month, I worked 20 hours every day on a very important project. My friend and my wife went on a sex rampage. Basically, she told me I would leave for the office at 345 in the morning, and my friend would come over at 4 and they would do their thing. And he would leave right before I got back, right around midnight. It went on for exactly one month and everything stopped after that month. Also, my friend left the apartment complex the next month as well. He rarely speaks to me or responds to my text messages anymore. I will write some more, but later, thanks for reading. Don't know what I am asking or interested to know. T the cops told me to sit down, that they needed a statement. I couldn't focus on anything but the clock. Tick, tick, tick. Every second felt like an hour with her gone. We understand this is difficult, sir, some lady officer said. But we need to know exactly what happened. What happened, that's the thing. What the hell did happen? One minute everything was normal. Well, okay, normal-ish. We'd had our fights lately, that's for sure. But it started out so perfect. Remember when we bought our house? God, she was so excited she practically skipped from room to room. We can paint this one blue. She laughed, her eyes practically sparkling. That smile of hers. That's the thing that got me in the first place. Stress at work, bad mood, didn't matter. That smile could melt all of it away. Then we tried for a baby. That wasn't so easy. Doctors, appointments, waiting. Month after month, those damn negative tests. I could see the life drain out of her a little each time. Finally, it happened, and man, her smile then, it could have outshone the sun. But after, things got, complicated. She'd get mad over nothing, snap at me if dinner wasn't perfect or I tracked a bit of dirt in from the garage. I tried to brush it off, thinking hormones or stress or something. But then the yelling started. Sometimes over nothing, sometimes I deserved it, I guess. Yesterday, she came up with this plan. I swear, the look in her eye, it didn't feel right. But I always tried to keep her happy, you know? We need money, she'd said, her voice hard. More money. I told her I couldn't just conjure up extra cash. She didn't like that. She told me to wait, that she had it figured out. Then she just left, didn't say where. 
I paced the house, feeling jumpy, a bad feeling in my gut that wouldn't go away. I texted her a few times, no answer. The news came on, that's when I knew something was way wrong. They were talking about a robbery, same area, about the same time she went out. When the cops showed up, well, that's when everything spiraled out of control. Now here I am, stuck in this room, and they're asking if I knew about it. I want to say no, of course not, but, the truth is, part of me wonders if that crazy look in her eyes, that tension, what if she really was capable of this? My whole body was buzzing, like I downed five coffees instead of just one. The cops just kept asking questions. They seemed fixated on whether I knew about, well, whatever it was she'd done. I just wanted to go home, check if she was back, if everything would somehow go back to normal. Didn't they get that this wasn't me? This wasn't us. Look, I'm not the type to brag about stuff, but damn it, I tried. Those long nights where the baby wouldn't stop screaming and I was up at the crack of dawn for work. That was me, pulling extra shifts so we could afford that fancy daycare. Me again, my old buddies asking me out for a beer. Nah, couldn't do it. Had to be a good husband, a good dad. Had to put them first. And it was worth it, for a while. Seeing her face light up when I brought home that expensive easel for her paintings, or watching the kids go wild on the swing set I built. That was enough. That was the payoff. Remember that kitchen remodel? The one where she picked out all those fancy tiles and that stupid farmhouse sink. Hell yeah, I worked my ass off on that, even after my back ached and my hands were blistered. Worth it to hear her humming happily while she cooked up one of her fancy dinners. I might not get the whole art thing, but I got that making her happy made me happy. Then it changed. That spark. It started flickering. The smiles got fewer, the complaints got louder. Suddenly, everything I did was wrong. Like that one Saturday I finally tried to squeeze in a round of golf. Just one lousy morning, and when I got back. Dot man, she laid into me like I'd never seen. Screaming that I never cared, that I was selfish. Okay. Maybe I snapped back, maybe we both said things we didn't mean. But hell, the next thing you know, she's coming up with this scheme of hers, saying it's our only way out. I finally got home after another day at the station. God, those people seemed extra unreasonable today. All I wanted was a hot meal, the kids tucked in bed, maybe half an hour of brainless TV before crashing. Just a normal night. But the dinner I'd left warming was still sitting on the counter, barely touched, and the kids were playing way past bedtime. I could hear her laughter coming from upstairs, she was on the phone, probably with one of her artsy friends. It wasn't even a special occasion, just another random night when I came home to a cold house and ignored food. That's when it started, that ache in my chest. I'd always been the kind of guy who brushed things off, who kept his head down and plowed through. But lately, it felt like something was off. Like the kitchen remodel, those fancy tiles she never even complimented, or that birthday present I'd spent way too much on, only to see it tucked away in a drawer a week later. Then there was our anniversary. That stung the most. I'd planned this surprise dinner reservation at that snobby place she always hinted about. But she came home late, some excuse about a client meeting running long, smelling like perfume that wasn't hers. She barely even apologized, just shrugged it off and asked what was for dinner. My buddy Dave pulled me aside last week, during our fishing trip. Hey man, uh, I don't want to butt in, but I saw your wife the other day. At lunch, with some guy, he looked uncomfortable, like he expected me to go off the deep end. I just laughed, told him it was probably a client or something and changed the subject. But afterward, I couldn't shake the image. Her, laughing across a table from a dude I've never seen. Those, late nights at work, started happening more often, all with lame excuses. Unexpected project, or, client dinner, stuff like that. Then those business trips popped up, quick overnighters to cities I couldn't place on a map. The doubt in the back of my mind grew bigger each day. I wanted to ask her straight out, but something held me back. Like I didn't want to face whatever the answer might be. The phone, man, that damn phone was glued to her hand. Texting at dinner, texting during the kids' bedtime stories, even texting in the freaking bathroom. I didn't like it, but when I mentioned it, she just rolled her eyes. It's work stuff, you know how demanding my clients can be. Whatever. Then came this, Ashley, person. Supposedly a new hire at her firm, some single mom struggling to make ends meet. My wife, bless her heart, 
felt the need to be her personal savior. I'm just mentoring her a bit, helping her out with the workload, she'd say. All well and good, except the, helping out, turned into late night texts and weekend phone calls. Once, I even overheard her whispering on the porch, voice all soft and sympathetic. When I finally got the nerve to confront her about it, that's when things got, weird. You're being ridiculous, she hissed. Trying to control me, just like always. It was like a switch had flipped. She made me feel bad for even questioning her, like I should be grateful she took time away from her charity work to grace me with her presence. I couldn't sleep right anymore. The worry gnawed at me like rats in the walls. Found myself snapping at the kids for stupid stuff that usually didn't even get a rise out of me. That model airplane I'd been building with my son sat in the garage, half finished, the pieces scattered like my sanity. Everything was unraveling. The other morning, I saw her texting in the car, driving the kids to school. That's what set me off. I yelled, right there in front of the kids. I'd never done that, never lost my cool like that. Her face got all hard, that icy glare she only used when she wanted me to feel small. The kids started crying in the back seat, and I knew, right then and there, that something was seriously wrong. Seriously, seriously wrong. I couldn't take it anymore. The phone calls, the late nights, the lies piling up like a stack of dirty laundry. This wasn't us, this wasn't how things were supposed to be. So, I did something I never thought I would. Found one of those shady ads in the back of some free newspaper, you know the kind, discreet investigations, results guaranteed. Sounded desperate, but I figured, hell, I already was desperate. The guy the first met with was this sleazy type, office in some rundown part of town. He looked me up and down, probably sizing up how much he could squeeze out of me. Didn't matter, I just needed answers. I showed him a picture of my wife, told him I wanted her followed. Gave him what little I could scrape together, and waited. The photos came a week later, thick manila envelope shoved under my door when I got home from work. My hands were shaking so bad I could barely open the damn thing. There she was, clear as day, getting into a car in some supermarket parking lot. Not her car, and the guy driving. Well, I'd be damned if it wasn't Matt. My best friend Matt. I went home, I wanted to throw up, to scream, to smash something. But I just stood there in the kitchen, the picture spread out on the counter, like I was some character in a bad movie. When she walked in that night, humming that same stupid tune she always did when she was feeling good, I couldn't hold it in anymore. I slammed the photos down in front of her. I don't even remember what I yelled, something about lies and betrayal and, and Matt. Her face did that thing, the way it twists when she's cornered. First, the denial, then the anger. How dare you? And, you're spying on me, like I was the bad guy here. But I wouldn't back down this time. Finally, it all came spilling out. Ashley, Matt, the affair that had been going on for months, maybe longer. My whole world started spinning. It took everything I had not to collapse right there on our perfectly tiled kitchen floor. Turns out, their families were tight too. Soccer games, barbecues. Dot all of it while they snuck around behind our backs. I felt sick, sick to my stomach, everything, all those years, all those talks about friendship and trust, just a big, fat punchline. The kids, I didn't know how to tell them, how to explain that their perfect world, the one I worked so hard to build, had exploded into a million shards. My little girl kept asking where mommy was, why she wasn't singing her bedtime song anymore. My boy, usually so full of energy, just got this quiet, sad look on his face. Every night they'd sneak into my room, and we'd all pile into my bed, clinging to each other like we were on a life raft in a storm. Then there were Matt and Ashley. Seeing their faces around town was like reopening a fresh wound. I'd always thought of Ashley as family. Our kids played together for years. Now, I couldn't even look at her without seeing them together, hearing her whispers on the phone, picturing their lies. And Matt, I didn't know if I wanted to punch him or just break down sobbing in front of him. I was completely lost, never been a talker, not about big feelings. So I did something I never thought I'd do. Called my brother. We haven't been close for years, always drifted apart for one stupid reason or another. But he answered my call, and his voice sounded, different. Older, I guess. Less cocky. It all came spilling out. The affair, the photos, the kids. I must have sounded half-crazed. But he just listened. 
For the first time in ages, I felt like someone was actually on my side. He told me to bring the kids and come stay at his place. A small apartment, nothing fancy, but it was enough. My in-laws, now that was a whole other mess. I guess I should have expected it, but they turned on me. Took their precious daughter's side, even after the proof, even with the kids crying and hurting. Her dad even threatened me. Said I'd never see my kids again if I took this any further. My world was collapsing, and the people who were supposed to protect her, defended her. Like the betrayal wasn't bad enough. It was my brother who finally talked some sense into me. Get yourself a lawyer, he said, and not some wishy-washy one. Get yourself a shark. I'd never been the confrontational type, always tried to make peace, keep things smooth. But sitting in my brother's cramped apartment, my kid sleeping on the worn-out sofa, something inside me snapped. We found this lawyer, a real sharp-dressed woman with eyes like steel. She didn't flinch when I told her the whole story, just took notes, that brow of hers furrowed. Then came the bombshell, turns out a lawyer helps with more than just the divorce stuff. They can dig. Every bank statement, every old credit card bill, it was all laid out under those harsh fluorescent lights in her office. The numbers didn't lie, designer clothes, fancy hotels in cities I'd never heard of. All while I was counting pennies to make sure the kids had new shoes for school. Her so-called, art career, was an excuse, a cover for this double life she'd built. Then came the whispers, started like background noise you try to ignore, then got louder, impossible to escape. People, friends I thought I could count on, suddenly acting different. Some offered awkward condolences, others avoided me altogether. The worst were the parents at the kids' school, used to be all friendly chats at pickup. Now, those smiles seemed strained, a mix of pity and, I knew there was something off, behind their eyes. Every day felt like a battle. In court, with the lawyers arguing over every plate or picture frame, like our lives were just items on a list. In town, feeling the judgment of strangers. At home. Well, my brother's place wasn't a home, not really. Just a waystation, a temporary shelter. But something shifted during those meetings with the lawyer, seeing the proof of it all in black and white. I wasn't just the sad, betrayed husband anymore. I was angry, damn angry, and that anger, it was fuel. I'd always been the, nice guy, but enough was enough. It was time to fight back for what was rightfully mine, for the kid's sake, for my own sanity. My phone buzzed with an unknown number. I almost didn't answer, figuring it was some telemarketer or another lawyer looking for a scrap of this mess. But something made me hesitate. I swiped to answer. Hello? I said, voice hoarse from exhaustion. As this, is your name, husband's name. A woman's voice, timid and familiar but I couldn't place it. Yeah, who's this? That's when it hit me. Ashley? I said, the name tasting like bitter acid in my mouth. Turns out, life likes a sick joke. After everything, she was the one who reached out. Said she saw my address listed in the court filings, wanted to talk. Against my better judgment, I agreed. Figured a bit more pain at this point wouldn't kill me. We met at a dingy little coffee shop on the edge of town. She looked, different, not the glamorous, put-together Ashley I remembered. This version was pale, eyes red-rimmed, a slump in her shoulders that mirrored my own. Turns out, Matt wasn't the prize she expected either. We talked, awkwardly at first, then the words poured out like we were both desperate to make sense of it all. The lies, the years of deception. She told me things about my wife, things about Matt, that made me want to be sick. And then she apologized, not for what she'd done, but for being part of hurting me, of hurting the kids. Even in mess of her own making, there was a flicker of decency in her. The kids, they're the hardest part. My little boy keeps drawing pictures of our family, the four of us together and smiling. My daughter keeps asking for mommy to read her favorite story, the one about the princess. I'd choke out some excuse, make up promises I can't keep, and hope they're still young enough to believe me. How do you explain the unexplainable to innocent eyes? Last night, after the kids finally slept, I did something I swore I'd never do. I went into the garage and pulled a bottle out from the back of the tool cupboard. I never was a big drinker, a beer after mowing the lawn kind of guy, but lately, lately, I just wanted to feel numb. I sat there on the floor, staring at the framed wedding photo propped up against a half-built workbench. All those promises, that beaming smile, such a damn lie. The rage bubbled up inside me, hot and uncontrollable. 
I let out a scream, a primal sound I didn't know I was capable of, and hurled the picture against the wall. The shattering glass was like ice water to the face. I collapsed on the floor right there, and I cried. Cried like I haven't since I was a little kid, sobbed until I had nothing left, until all that remained was a cold emptiness. Somewhere, in the back of my mind, was the thought I should clean it up, that the kids shouldn't see. But all I felt in that moment was bone-deep exhaustion and a question, was I ever good enough, anyway? Character assassination, that's what my lawyer called it. Each week in court, it was a new lie. I was abusive, neglectful, mentally unstable. The kind of accusations that make a good man doubt himself for just a second. Then I'd look at my kids, their faces pale and drawn, and the rage would blaze white-hot in me again. She'd turned them into pawns in this vicious game. Coached them, I think. Their once bright eyes that used to light up when they saw me were now weary, filled with questions I couldn't answer, accusations I couldn't fathom. Every visit had a new sting, a new accusation, tearing me apart piece by piece. Funny thing happened though. My sister, who'd always been quiet, barely a voice in our family, changed right before my eyes. She wouldn't stand for it. Started dropping by every morning to help with the kids, her no-nonsense voice cutting through the chaos. Eat your breakfast, she'd tell them, not asking, but not me neither. At night, she'd put on her glasses and go to war with my lawyer, scouring the paperwork with a look that could make a grown man squirm. The trial, it was hell. Having to recount the worst moments of my life for a room full of strangers. Seeing her sitting there, not even looking ashamed, and that loser mad shifting in his seat like a cornered rat. The dirt the lawyers dug up, the proof that her fancy, trips, were all paid for by my sweat and sacrifice. Every word was like a punch to the gut, but somewhere in the back of my mind, it solidified something. I wasn't gonna go under without a fight, not for my kids, not for myself. We didn't get everything we wanted. Judge seemed to think splitting things down the middle was, fair. Money from the house sale would be tied up forever, and worse, she'd still get visitation. But damn it, I got primary custody. Restrictions put on Matt, and her spending spree? The judge didn't take kindly to that, not at all. Leaving the courthouse, I didn't feel victorious, but something close to it. The kids were little less wary, my sister actually hugged me, and the sky above didn't seem so oppressive anymore. Now it's just us. Our, perfect, house is full of half-finished projects and more dust bunnies than you'd believe. But washing a load of dishes, it's different somehow. It's my mess to clean. My kids to feed. This bottle's not over. Far from it. But there's a flicker inside me, a stubborn refusal to Reddit relationship advice. My wife cheated on me at the party while I was drunk and passed out. It was my birthday and I wanted to celebrate with all of our friends. My friend threw a big party for me. So, my best friend was hosting my birthday party at his house. He was notorious for hosting parties when we were in college. My wife and I attended and we started drinking right after we got there. We were both having a good time and it felt like old times. I had a few too many drinks and my wife, who usually never has more than one or two, I kept pouring them down her throat. My wife then got the brilliant idea to go outside on the back porch for a cigarette. She was having trouble walking by this point. So, I helped her out there. Once we were outside on the back porch, she started talking about how the party was fun and glad we came to hang out with our friend. So, I started drinking again and I lost track of time. Next thing I know, she leaned over, pulled me in with her arm, kissed me. And then we just started to make out for a few minutes. I could tell my wife was getting aroused. I guess it was the alcohol. As the night goes on, we were partying, drinking, dancing, and just having a good time. As the night goes on, I noticed, even in my drunken state, that my wife is disappearing on occasion. I thought she was just using the restroom, but near the end of the night, I see her talk to a guy on and off and they disappear into a bedroom together. They didn't stay long, maybe a minute or two, they came right out. So, I didn't think anything of it. The night goes on with us still drinking and dancing. I am starting to get a little lightheaded and not being able to stand up. So, I find myself a spot on the couch and sit. My wife is up talking to my buddy. He is the one hosting the birthday party. They talk for a few minutes and then my wife comes over and sits next to me and asked me if I was okay. I told her, yes, I am just a little drunk and she giggles. Then she leans over and kisses me and says, I have to go to the bathroom. 
When she goes to the bathroom, I noticed she doesn't come back for an hour. When she gets back, I ask her, is everything okay? She says, yes, I was feeling a little queasy. I said, oh, okay. I am glad you are not sick. Then I asked my buddy to get me another drink. I am absolutely toasted, but I continue to drink until I start nodding off, like I am falling asleep. My buddy sees this and says, hey, let's go. He then comes over and helps me up and takes me upstairs to one of his bedrooms, puts me in the bed and I go right to sleep. At about 3ish am, I am awakened by a noise in the next bedroom. It's a little bit down the hallway, but it was enough to wake me out of a dead sleep. As I stumbled out of bed and slowly make my way down the hallway. When I get to the door to look in, I couldn't believe it. My wife is having sex with some random guy I have never seen in my life. I said, what the hell? They both jump out of their skin. I said to the guy, this is my wife, get away from her. He moves away from her and goes to pick up his clothes. I just stare at my wife and say, how could you really, you are cheating on me in the same house. And I am just a few feet away from you. Wow. At that point, I go back to the room I was asleep in and gather my things. I walk to the front door, get in the car and drive home. I get home, still in shock at what I saw. About 20 minutes later, my wife comes in with tears rolling down her face, makeup all messed up. She starts bawling, apologizing profusely. I shook my head at her and said, I was in the next room. How could you cheat on me with me being so close? What she said next, shocked the hell out of me. The only thing she said was, it just happened. I said, that's all you have to say. It just happened. I said, don't talk to me anymore. Tonight, the next morning, I call up my friend and ask him, did he know the guy who slept with my wife at the party? He said, what, what are you talking about? I explained to him that my wife cheated on me at the party in the bedroom, down the hall from where I was sleeping. He couldn't believe it. He said, he didn't notice anything because he was downstairs most of the night and he didn't notice my wife go upstairs with anyone. And, he said, he didn't know the guy. He may have been a friend of someone who he invited. I got off the phone with my friend. At this point, I am unsure of what to do next. Witnessing that made me rethink this whole marriage and how she could be so bold to cheat on me like that. It's still mid-morning. So, I go take a walk to gather my thoughts on what transpired the night before. I get back to the house after walking for about 45 minutes. I walk in and my wife comes up to me and says, she is sorry for what she did. I said, I don't believe you. She said, I promise you it was a mistake and not intentional. I tell her that she needs to leave the house now because we are done. There was no excuse for you cheating on me like that. And, to do it right under my nose, I said, you really need to leave. This is where things got ugly. She started screaming at me and then throw something at my head. She kicks me in the shin while yelling more obscenities until I pushed her out of the way and told her to get out or else someone might call the cops on us for domestic violence. And so, there I am with an angry wife who can't keep herself from hitting me when provoked and no home life whatsoever. She is still yelling at me as she walks away to our bedroom. She starts packing things and telling me she didn't care that she cheated. I didn't say anything after she made that horrible comment. A few minutes go by, she grabs about four suitcases and takes them out to her car, gets in and leaves. I have no idea where she went. So, four days go by and I haven't heard from my wife. I am really not concerned because of what she did. She calls me and asks, can she come back home? I said, no, we are done. Did you think this was just a cooling off period? No, we are done. I have an appointment with an attorney this afternoon to get the divorce process started. She then pleads for me not to do that. I said, it's already in motion. She hangs up the phone. At that point, I am thinking, I won't hear much more from her today, but to my surprise, 30 minutes later, she walks in the house. She still has a key. I didn't get the locks changed yet and asked me, why am I discarding her so quickly? I said, you cheated on me and the way you did it, you betrayed me. We were married for 11 years and all of a sudden, alcohol makes you cheat like that. I told her all of this is on you. I couldn't imagine my wife of 11 years would cheat on me in a room down the hall. She interrupts me and says, but we were drunk. I said, it doesn't matter. Now we are done. There is nothing you can say or do to make me change my mind. 
she starts crying again and walks out the door. Another three days go by and I have to pick up some items from the store. I get to the store, lo, and behold, I run into the soon-to-be ex-wife and tell her I need the address to where she is staying for some legal documents. She refuses to give me an address and walks off. I said to myself, okay, as she is walking out the door and into the parking lot, I noticed she gets in a car, the passenger side, and some guy is driving. I couldn't make out who he was. I have the address to her parents' house, so I will give the attorney that address, but I do have the address to where she works. I will have the divorce papers served there. At this point, my goal is to get the divorce done as soon as possible. Her attitude has changed in less than a week and seems worse than before. So, I leave the grocery store, get back home, and I immediately call the attorney and ask him how long will the divorce process take. He says it could take up to 90 days or longer in some cases. I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. He says that there would have to be a hearing and all of this other paperwork needs to be filed in order for the divorce process to start. So then we hang up the phone and he tells me not to worry about anything else until after the 90 days is over. That's just crazy talk. It should take no more than 30 days at most, but this time frame could take up to 6 months or longer. One thing has been on my mind. Who is she cheating with now? She cheated on me before when I caught her at the party. And now this, who is she doing it again with? This has been a nightmare relationship for me in the last week. Is there any Reddit advice you can give to help get over this until my divorce is final? This concludes this Reddit relationship, my wife and I were married for 10 years. I was my wife's first, and as I believed, her only sexual partner. We tied the knot when we were both 22 years old, and the incident that I'm about to share happened 10 years later when we were 32. My wife informed me that she was going on a vacation with her sister, but during the week she was away, her messages became strange and infrequent. I grew anxious about her well-being, and upon her return, her behavior only confirmed my fears. Just before the COVID-19 outbreak hit the United States, my wife mentioned feeling unwell and decided to schedule a doctor's appointment. However, she went to a second appointment without disclosing any details to me. Concerned about her health, I felt left in the dark and desperately wanted answers, so I searched her car for any appointment summaries or clues that could give me some insight. To my shock, I discovered an open STD test and a visit summary for her doctor revealing that she tested positive for herpes. My world began to crumble, and I was overwhelmed with emotions. I sat in her car for a while, staring at the trees around me, trying to process what I had just found. After discovering that my wife had tested positive for herpes, I knew that I could no longer be intimate with her. I felt scared and worried about my own health, so I decided to stay with my mother for a few days while waiting for my own test results. My wife seemed preoccupied with her own concerns and hardly noticed my absence. Thankfully, my results came back negative, meaning that I hadn't contracted the virus from her, nor had I passed it on to her. However, I still had concerns that needed addressing. I was frustrated that she hadn't informed me about her diagnosis, and I had many questions. Despite this, I realized that some answers were unnecessary, and my wife needed to confront the reality of the situation. Knowing how my wife contracted herpes wasn't a priority for me. What mattered was that she had it. During her vacation with her sister, they worked together in the same office, which gave me an idea. I received an email invitation to a work party, and it included the email addresses of my wife's colleagues and bosses. I took the opportunity to email them a picture of my wife's diagnosis, and added a message that she had brought home a present from her vacation. The response was overwhelming. Before my wife could find out what I had done, her sister called me, asking what was going on. I told her everything. When her sister called me, she admitted that she hadn't been with my wife the whole time they were on vacation. Initially, she thought it was unfair of me to share my wife's private issue with her co-workers. However, after I expressed my frustrations to her and mentioned the possibility of divorce, she began to support my actions. Suddenly, my wife appeared outside and started banging on the car window. She looked furious and terrified, screaming and crying incoherent words. I got out of the car, and she began hitting me until I revealed that I knew she had cheated on me. At that point, she couldn't hold herself together. My wife was clearly overwhelmed, and had probably not fully come to terms with her STD or her infidelity. When I revealed that I knew about her affair and the STD, she broke down in tears, trying to apologize and explain that she had used protection. But I wasn't willing to listen. I felt deeply betrayed, and I knew I could never be intimate with her again. 
Eventually, she went back inside defeated after I told her to pack her things and leave. Her sister, who had been on the phone during our confrontation, came over to help her pack and offer some words of encouragement about the future. My wife's motivation completely vanished when she tried to return to work. She was met with a barrage of backlash and shame from her co-workers for what she had done to me. Whether it was to her face or notes left on her desk, she was insulted, called out, and slandered. She could only endure one day of work before quitting. Her sister has been very quiet since then. And as far as I know, my wife still lives with her. I wouldn't be surprised if she's avoiding dating for a while or having trouble forgiving herself. As for me, I consider myself fortunate to have done my own investigation and to have separated myself from her while I figured out what I needed to know. In the end, I was able to dodge a bullet. I hope that she practices safe sex and discloses both her diagnosis and infidelity to her partners. I am deeply sorry for what happened to you, Ope. Your wife's actions were extremely disrespectful and breached the trust you had in her. It will be difficult for her to overcome the mistakes she made. You trusted her when you let her go on vacation without you, but she took advantage of that trust by having sexual relations with another man. It's a form of cosmic justice that she contracted an STD. It's fortunate that she didn't try to initiate sexual contact with you before you found out about what happened. You definitely avoided a disastrous outcome. It's a relief to know that she couldn't conceal her diagnosis and was forced to confront the shame she deserved for cheating on her husband. Any woman who thinks she needs someone else to love her needs a serious wake-up call. True love is meant to be between two people who communicate openly and choose to love each other unconditionally instead of taking advantage of their partner's trust. Okay, I wish you all the best. You made the right decision by investigating and finding out the truth. Thank you for sharing your story. Let's move on to the second story of the day. Last Valentine's Day marked the end of my seven-year marriage with my 33-year-old wife. She was supposed to finish work at 5 p.m., but at 4.50 p.m., she sent me a text saying that her aunt had a date for Valentine's Day, and since she had trouble finding dates, she felt obligated to babysit her kids for her. I suggested that I could meet her there, but she told me it wasn't necessary. Her aunt was uncomfortable with men being at her house because her children were recovering from their abusive father who had been out of the picture for some time. This conversation really upset me, but I decided to be just as selfless as my wife on this special day. Initially, I believed her story for about an hour. However, things changed when she posted a status update revealing her location. She made sure to block me and our mutual friends from seeing it, but she overlooked one person, her 15-year-old cousin, the child she was supposed to be babysitting. The cousin actually messaged me to ask how I was doing and shared some troubling news. The cousin showed me a screenshot of my wife's status and location, which indicated that she was having a lovely Valentine's Day at a fancy restaurant. The cousin was quite observant and noticed that my wife didn't tag me or include a photo of us together, which was unusual. Due to these inconsistencies, she suspected that something was amiss and decided to inform me. I didn't disclose to the cousin that my wife had used her as a cover-up for the babysitting lie, but I thanked her instead. Afterward, I checked the family locator app, which we never argued about. Since my wife's phone wasn't at the restaurant she claimed to be at and we were always together, I decided to dig a little deeper. I messaged one of my wife's co-workers on Facebook to inquire if she knew anything. She immediately revealed that something was likely happening between my wife and a colleague from the office. She mentioned that they would exchange work documents at each other's cubicles, but she suspected that they were actually passing handwritten notes. Additionally, she mentioned that they ate lunch together in the small office kitchen every day. It appeared that my wife and her colleague were attempting to conceal their relationship and portray themselves as nothing more than co-workers. I was surprised by how easy it was to gather information from people. Had I been oblivious all along? Although I couldn't check my wife's phone, I informed her coworker about my wife's fabricated Valentine's Day story and her current location in a different neighborhood. The coworker asked if she was at Sunny Day Development, which stunned me as it was the exact location where App, the colleague, lived. Apparently, my wife was at his house. I remembered showing her that spot once during a party. My wife's icon hovered over the neighborhood and she said it was definitely close enough to be his house. I had enough. I thanked her and got off social media. I started throwing my wife's clothes and belongings out the window. Loose clothes were strewn all over the yard and roof. It started raining before she got home and I thought karma was just giving me an extra hand. I wrote a note to put on our front door that read, Happy Valentine's Day. Don't bother coming back ever again. 
When she got home late, I could hear her screaming and freaking out. She pounded on the door and repeatedly rang the doorbell, but I had barricaded myself inside. I could hear her talking on the phone with her mother and father and it seemed like they were surprised that she was locked out of her own house with her clothes strewn across the yard. She insisted that she didn't know why this was happening, but eventually she broke down and admitted to lying about having a date with someone else. She had asked her father for help in moving her belongings elsewhere. I could only imagine that her parents questioned her motives, but all she could say was that she didn't know. She had refrained from telling me about the situation as she feared my reaction. When she finally disclosed what had happened over the phone with her father, she sounded remorseful and ashamed of her actions like a pitiful little girl who had made a grave mistake by lying and on her spouse, thinking she could get away with it. Her father arrived to help her and I stepped outside to confront them both. I told them that I had learned of her infidelity while she was away and despite her tearful denials and accusations of exaggeration, I challenged her to prove me wrong by showing me her messages with the other person involved. I confronted her about the other person involved and her face turned pale when I mentioned his real name. Despite her denial of having any messages with him, I could sense her father's disappointment and I asked him if he believed that she was lying. He hesitated, feeling embarrassed, but eventually agreed with me. This caused her to start screaming and wailing, eventually dropping to the ground. I sternly told her to gather herself because she was an adult who made the conscious decision to cheat on me and deceive me on Valentine's Day. Now she had to face the consequences of her actions. Her devastation was evident and I could sense that she didn't want our marriage to end that night. Although she didn't want our marriage to end, she made the decision not to return to our home, leaving behind her beloved dog without the opportunity to say goodbye. Fortunately, we never had children because it would have been even more heartbreaking. Her actions serve as a lesson to others to carefully consider the consequences of betraying the trust of the person who matters most in their life. Every action has its own set of repercussions and she had to face the consequences of hers. She stayed with her parents for some time, but they were extremely disappointed and skeptical of her words. She was not allowed to leave her parents' house unless it was for work. And even then, she had to return promptly as any delay was unacceptable. I'm sorry to hear about your wife's betrayal on Valentine's Day. Although it's just like any other day, the fact that it's associated with true love makes it even more hurtful. I'm relieved that you were able to uncover the truth through your investigation. It's fortunate that the person your wife used in her lie came forward, unaware of her involvement in the deception. Your ex-wife turned a kind gesture into a falsehood that was difficult to accept. It's impossible to sustain a relationship built on such a foundation of dishonesty. It's difficult to even imagine how one could have a healthy relationship with your ex after what she did. She needs to mature and understand the value of loyalty and honesty in a relationship. Without those qualities, she doesn't deserve the benefits of a romantic partnership. Despite the difficulty, you made the right decision to distance yourself from her. I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Thank you all for taking the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed listening, please feel free to like and subscribe if you haven't already. Also comment below with your thoughts on what happened. Got a story emailed to me yesterday afternoon. Here it is. My name is David and for the last 20 years, I have worked as a physician's assistant, beginning in the US Navy and working today for a private practice. I met my now ex-wife, Chris, while on vacation in Florida. We met sitting at a bar and struck up a conversation and finally exchanged phone numbers. Chris was living in Alabama at the time and was just out of high school. I was still in the US Navy at the time and already had plans to stay in. I was still speaking to Chris at least three or four times a week over the phone. I was also seeing a civilian that worked for the Navy at the Norfolk Naval Base. I was at the time assigned to the main naval hospital at Portsmouth, Virginia. Gina was a great girl that I still sometimes think about. I guess you can call what happened to me with Chris as karma, because I hurt Gina, because of my attraction to Chris. Chris applied to transfer to Old Dominion University and was accepted. When Chris got to Norfolk, I broke it off with Gina. Gina was upset, but accepted the situation and several years later, married another man and moved away from the area. Chris also got a job working in Virginia Beach to help pay for her room and board. Chris was a natural blonde with a slender body build. I know I should have not been so trusting. As I looked back at those times, I know I really made a bad mistake trusting her. About a year after Chris started school in Norfolk, my detailer sent me a message. I was being transferred from Portsmouth to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. I stayed there for almost two years and was again, transferred back to Portsmouth. 
I was close enough to Norfolk that I saw Chris about once every six weeks or so. One day while in Norfolk, I was sitting, having a meal in an open-air restaurant. When a sailor came up to me and told me Chris was cheating on me. I asked him, how do you know this? He scratched his head a bit and said, sir, I have no proof other than my word. I sure wished I had listened. I thought it was so silly. That evening with Chris, I did not even mention the conversation to her. When I got back to Portsmouth by this time, Chris was about to graduate. Chris was planning to teach school and already had a job lined up in the area. I decided to ask Chris to marry me. I borrowed one of her rings so I could get her ring size, right. Then bought a ring for her. Then one day I asked Chris to marry me and she said, yes, David, I will be your wife. I was the happiest man in Virginia that next week. We got married soon after and Chris already graduated, started working as a high school teacher in the area. I worked at a bit of a weird schedule and never could be sure at the time I finally got off work. Then I could be home at 2 p.m. or as late as 9 p.m., just depends on the workload. And if I was working in the ER, if I got home first, I cooked. If Chris got home first, she cooked and we both cleaned the kitchen. Then one day, about six months later, Chris told me she was pregnant. While Chris was pregnant, we made a nursery and I was so happy to be a father. Chris was just glowing then. For almost four months, I was able to be there when Chris was seeing her doctor. Then one day, Chris met me in the hall and asked me to not be present during the exam. This request was honored, but it felt funny. I remember walking back to where I worked and finally got my mind off that situation. That afternoon when I came home, I noticed Chris was not at home, no note and nothing that looked like dinner was being made. So, I made myself some dinner. I made a plate for Chris and covered it with tinfoil and placed it in the oven. After this, I sat in the living room, reading the paper and finally watched some TV. Still, no Chris. I decided to send her a short text, no reply. I gave it some thought, but realized if I started looking for Chris, she could come home and I would not know it. So, I said, okay, she is a big girl. I am going to bed, but I was mad as hell. When I got into bed that night, about two hours later, Chris came home. I was awake when she tried to be quiet as she got undressed. I flipped on the lamp and asked her, where did you go? Chris angrily snapped back at me saying she would not be interrogated like a common criminal. After she got to sleep, I quietly packed some clothes and slipped out of the house. I drove over to a hotel near the base and registered for a room. That next morning, Chris called me and apologized for what happened. I said, we can talk about it tonight. I went back to work. I also did not go home that night. I went back to my room, turned my phone off. One of the duty nurses knew where I was staying and my room number, but was told not to tell anybody where I was. I did not enter the hospital normally through the lobby. Chris was sitting in the lobby, waiting on me. I see her as I walked close by, I went directly to my boss and asked him if I could take some time off. He said, take the day, but stay close by because I might need you. I did not say anything to Chris and left the hospital and returned home. I was on the couch taking a nap when I heard Chris pull up in the driveway. I was half expecting fire and brimstone, but Chris came in and said she was sorry. She spent that day alone, thinking about her life and being a soon-to-be mother. The only problem was the request to stay out of the exam room, followed by my ignored texts that I later confirmed she got. I did not fully believe her. However, like the senpai was, I forgot about it all. And Chris, until her delivery, never asked me to stay out of the exams. By the time the baby was here, my parents were also here. My in-laws were staying with us and my parents were staying in a hotel. My father is now a retired thoracic surgeon, and they were staying in one of the most expensive hotels in the Norfolk area. When Katie was born, I was just so glad it was all over. I was not paying all that close attention to the baby. Then about 20 or so minutes after the delivery, both sets of parents saw Katie for the first time. It was my father-in-law that first noticed something was not right. Then my father's face was white as a sheet. Katie was part Asian. My parents and I left the room. And by this time, my mother was in tears and my father was so angry. He could have chewed metal and spit it out. My parents said they had no interest in Katie, was glad she was healthy and left. To this day, they have never seen her again. I remember crying as I walked to a break room for a cup of coffee. I was there when Chris's dad found me. It's funny. 
You hear all these stories when men say their little girl can do no wrong. Not this man. He also got a cup of coffee, told me Chris's mom was looking after her. He told me directly, David, do not sign that birth certificate, unless you are willing to be that little girl's father. I made sure the proper people were notified. I was not Katie's biological father. Chris's parents stayed near Chris that night and about midnight returned back to my home. They had taken photos of the baby and asked me if they could use my PC to upload them. I said, yes. I then went to bed. I don't know which one it was, but one of Chris's parents told her to leave me alone that night. I did go up to her room that next morning. Chris was not in a good mood at all. I told her to wait on her parents to take her home. I was going back to work. I lied. I went that morning and rented a small storage unit and packed all my things. My parents helped me. By the time Chris got to the house, my stuff was gone. I never entered that house again. In the coming weeks, I decided I was getting out of the Navy. I applied for, and was hired by one of the physicians that worked with my father. Six months later, I was no longer in the US Navy or Virginia. I hired a very good lady attorney who also had a good private investigator on retainer. In the coming months, I discovered everything there's to know about Chris's AP. He was a son of an Air Force fighter pilot and his Filipino wife. Brad was a cop that worked in the same area where Chris taught school. My father told me to talk to Chris and give her the divorce papers. Don't just have her served. So, I decided to see her at a place on the Norfolk Naval Base and gave her the papers. I advised her to hire an attorney. I also told her that within the next 30 days, I was no longer going to be in the US Navy. She was going to lose all her military medical care and really needed to get her insurance from her job. As I was leaving, Chris grabbed my hand and was weeping as she asked me to sit down. First, she told me that she was not going to fight me on the divorce. She again, apologized for not allowing me in that exam room that day. She was asking the doctor about a prenatal DNA test. Chris never said if she got one, my attorney was able to pull some strings and got me a hearing date so I could get out of Virginia quickly. I was out of the Navy by that time. And my parents were helping me out with housing until that hearing was finished. The day of the hearing came and Chris brought Katie with her. Her parents were there as well. When the clerk called the case, I walked up to my place and Chris walked to hers. Our attorneys both were speaking to the judge. Here is where things go surreal for me. My attorney showed the judge photos of Katie and me. She also had the private investigator tell the judge what he discovered. The judge asked me if I was sure this is what I wanted. I said, yes. Then he turned to Chris and their attorney said, I had a history of being mentally abusive to Chris. I remember turning my head in her direction and mouthing the words, really Chris? I looked back toward her parents and her father was shaking his head. Chris was asked by the judge to give him some examples of my mental abuse. She mumbled some things. Then the attorney said, because we were married at the time, I should be paying child support. My attorney and I both were caught off guard by this demand. My attorney mentioned some Virginia case law and the judge spent a few minutes looking at his computer screen. I was still looking at Chris at that time. The judge noticed this and told me to look at him. My attorney also added that there's DNA reports along with my case paperwork. Finally, the judge told Chris that under the circumstances, he can't award child support. He did tell Chris to get the biological father involved. We were renting a house. All my things were already in storage. Chris and I had about $1,500 worth of things from a local furniture store. I told the judge I would pay it off. My father sent a check several days later, Chris stayed in the house for about two years. Her AP dumped her out of spite. She told his wife and went after him for child support. Chris asked me several times to take her back. Every time I just ignored her. As I write this, I am looking at a recent photo of Katie. She will be starting the first grade this fall. I don't refer to her as my daughter, but I did speak to Chris's parents about her. Her parents were always great to me. They loved that grandbaby as grandparents should. Her father told me as long as they are alive, Katie will be taken care of. Katie can't be blamed. Because her mother is a thought. I am still single these days. I am also 100% MGDOW. Sometimes these days, when I think about that stunt Chris pulled in court, I break out in a cold sweat. I work hard, but I also play hard. 
I love to hunt and fish with my dad. There is one thing though, that sticks out according to my father, because Chris and I were married. She gave Katie her married name that she did keep. My father can't stand that. He doesn't hate Katie, but doesn't want kids that are not his carrying his father's